Live from Seattle, Washington, it's theCUBE. Covering DockerCon 2016. Brought to you by Docker. Now, here are your hosts, John Furrier and Brian Gracely. Hello everyone and welcome to another special presentation of SiliconANGLE Media's The Cube. We are here live for two days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage in Seattle for DockerCon. Docker containers, all the madness in cloud and, and uh, developers. I'm John Furrier with my co-host Brian Gracie for this show. And again, we've been uh, on the spring tour, wall-to-wall -to -wall events, mm. covering over 100 events this year. Look for theCUBE in, in the moment, in the now, finding out all the action. Docker with big funding, Greylock and all their syndicates, Brian, Grace Lee and I are going to break it all down. Brian, Docker has a lot to do here at the show. Ecosystem is booming. Yep. The show feels like Amazon early days. Yep. Yeah, I know, that there's so many storylines going on this week. I mean, you've got uh, how fast Docker continues to grow. You know, 75 people at their event two years ago, 4,000 here today. Uh, I think Ben Golub said they had had four billion downloads of, of the Docker container. So really big numbers, big community numbers. A uh, lot of new ecosystem uh, players here. We're going to interview a number of them this week. Uh, you know, the ecosystem's friendly on one side, they're competitive on the other side. I mean, there's so many storylines this week, it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, and one of the things I love about this open source community, we've been covering really since the beginning of open source, uh, since the Cube started, from the Hadoop ecosystem, OpenStack, we saw that move. Now the digital transformation is on the top of everyone's agenda. Yep. So there's a lot of pressure in this ecosystem, I can almost feel it kind of oozing on the floor, to commercialize faster. Yep. There is more demand from customers to get stuff deployed that's cloud native and or legacy integration for real-time development right. around data, around cloud. So there's pressure right now to right. put some meat on the bone. I want to get out of the speeds and feeds and talk about business outcome. Docker seems to be in a good position, but are they? Are they, are they going to be commercializing, going for that business model, or continue to nurture the ecosystem and find, hopefully find a home, what's your thoughts? Well, the, the big thing with Docker is always you have to remember, are we talking about Docker the community, or are we talking about Docker Inc? Uh, Docker the community has done a fantastic job of figuring out how do I make it easier for developers? If I'm making it easier for developers, you're going to get more productivity, you're going to get more applications, more stuff's coming out there. Uh, are they making money? That's the great question. We'll have to sort of ask the ecosystem this week. We'll talk to some of the executives this week. Uh, that part, you know, I think is still early days, uh, but they're doing a lot of things, again, to your point, help developers. How do I help developers? How do I make them go faster? How do I make them more productive? You know, am I going to get a new app in a car, or am I trying to tie off some new way to get to a mainframe from mobile phone? That's all the things they're trying to figure out. It's interesting, when I spoke with Jerry Chen before he made this big investment, it was his first investment at Greylock, CUBE alumni, Jerry, we'll see you on Tuesday, um, if you're watching. Um, it's really interesting, because Greylock just doesn't invest in me too companies. Right. They want to invest in the next Amazon, the next, uh, big thing, they're not, yeah. they, they go big or go home is kind of their philosophy. So you look at Docker, it seems like on one hand they're groping to be that IT player, right. he liked VMware, you see him almost kind of testing the waters on a business model, which could take him down this road of a me too IT player. Yeah. At the same time you have this explosion of cloud native where there's management, orchestration, and security and identity. Yes. So it's almost like they're in an innovator's dilemma. It's interesting to see what their moves are. What's your thoughts? Because they have to, at some point, take a turn. Are they IT, me too, Bender, kind of disrupt the incumbents, or are they going to be game changing? It's, it's, it's a great question because they have, they have tentacles in so many places here. I mean, they're, they're kind of a cloud provider. They're kind of an IT provider. They're definitely following VMware's playbook, which you know, tremendously successful in the early days, helping people transform their infrastructure, transform IT operations. That to me is, is one of the big questions is, who's, who's the buyer of Docker? Is it developers? You know, everyone talks about developers, the kingmakers, but do they hold the coin, do they hold the purse? We know IT operations and production holds the purse. Um, you know, I think they have a huge opportunity around security, around identity, and all those things on the edge. Uh, they're trying to be involved in the core of, of people's applications. They're trying to be involved with networking and storage and being a cloud provider, and uh, that's a lot of balls to keep up in the air. Uh, it gives them a lot of surface area for people to, to go after them. So I don't know so much if it's a me too thing. I think if it's more of a, you know, can I execute on a few things really well, or am I trying to do too many things? It's interesting, they have a couple of market forces that are, um, you could say tailwinds or headwinds, depending on how you look at it. Yeah. One is, when Docker first came out, and the, then the Docker ecosystem, Docker Inc., they really were non-threatening, they really were a galvanizing force 
very similar to the Linux days and, uh, right. around people getting around them. But then all of a sudden, the incumbents, you see VMware, you see IBM, CoreOS, Red Hat, even Amazon has a container as a service, Amazon Web Services. So in a way you have co-opetition or competitors. Yes. At the same time, the market's softening on the financial side. You're seeing a lot of consolidation. LinkedIn just sold to Microsoft at $26 billion. So it's interesting, Docker Inc. is really at this moment of truth. Yeah, no, They've absolutely. got to decide what they're going to be when they grow up because you could argue that an M&A opportunity could be right there for multiple billions of dollars between Microsoft and IBM for sure, right. maybe others. And then over the top, you got Google with Kubernetes putting the squeeze on the ecosystem. Your thoughts? Yeah, no, you know, I, I tweeted it out this morning, there's probably at least a billion dollars in VC money floating around in containers. You know, uh, uh, Docker's got probably a hundred and something million, but you've got Pivotal just took 250. You've got people like, like uh, Google, like AWS, who obviously have a ton of money to go compete against them. Uh, you know, we're seeing acquisitions. Uh, we recently saw, you know, Prenda by Kismatic. They're in the they're in the Kubernetes space. So, they're not. They don't. They don't own the market. They obviously have the most dominant brand in the container space. Uh, but you can see people like Google, AWS, Azure, uh, being able to offer them as a service. They're not paying Docker anything to offer that service. So you're right. They got to figure out who they want to be. They got to figure out who their audience is. Uh, and right now, I think you know it's it's still you know not completely clear where they're going with all that. So I want to read um, something here from the, from a, um, an email I got. It said really love Wikibon's new digital business platform research agenda, yep. and you just put out a, um, a piece that's behind the paywall for the Wikibon subscribers around emerging architectures for cloud native applications, which you could also imply cloud native and integrating with legacy. Right. But what is this new digital business platform research that your and Wikibon team is working on? Yeah, in, in the simplest terms is, you know, a lot of legacy IT was focused on trying to make the business productive. You know, the back-end feed, back-end functionality, things that their customers didn't see. Everything around this new digital business is about things that, that their customers are going to see. So applications facing their customers, how do I collect data from those applications, you know, use feedback loops within the, within the business, let the product managers see what's happening, let the executives see what's happening, but doing all this in real time, focused on trying to change their markets, change it. So, you know, we see the automotive industry now is thinking about their vehicles as, as technology. We're seeing, uh, you know, healthcare, we're seeing agriculture, we're seeing manufacturing. They're all trying to figure out, as I touch my customer, how do I use data in real time to do that? And so that's, that's really what this whole digital business platform thing's been about. So Rob Hof, uh, our uh, editor at uh, Silicon Angle and I were talking, he says a lot of the stuff we talk about here at the shows are very geeky, Kubernetes, microservices, a lot of stuff under the hood that you have in your report, you right. detail out real, quite well, really is very important. So if you could just give the 101 on what Kubernetes and microservices are, right. In so relation to why it's important. Yeah, the simplest way to think about it is, when you, in, in today's world, you have a lot of unknowns. So you don't know if you're going to be the next Instagram, you're going to be the next WhatsApp, you're going to be the next whatever. In essence, what these technologies do is they say, you have an application, you'd like it to scale up or scale down based on how popular you're going to be, and you know what, I'd like the system to just take care of that for me. That's what these technologies do, whether you're talking about Docker and Swarm, or we're talking about Kubernetes, or anything else which has a funny name. They're really just there to say, let automation take care of scaling up and down, making them always available, and you just focus on building a great application, and if the market loves it, great, we'll scale up. If the market doesn't love it as much, it'll scale back down. Take all that, care of that automatically. Okay, so I got to ask you the question we always like to ask the, uh, the chessboard. Right. on this landscape. What's the battleground right now? Um, because you're looking at a lot of different areas. You, you and I were talking before we came on about identity, but also the <laughs> announcements really kind of have the buzzwords, democratization of containers. Yeah. Orchestration is another word we're constantly hearing more and more about as a really relevant piece. What does that mean and why is it important? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of inertia fighting innovation, right? So we know the inertia of IT, we know how much money is going into IT, whether that's Oracle spend or Cisco spend or EMC spend, whatever it is. The real question for the chessboard is, how fast are we going to see new applications built? We see lots of startups kicking in all the, all, all the time, but how fast is an enterprise going to build a new application? And if you're the company that can help them build it faster, you know, again, I go back to the car analogy, you know, Ford trying to build things for the car, but, but no matter what that is, you're trying to help doctors. If you can be that company, that technology that helps, you know, a business leader go, I got a great idea and I want to execute it in software, you got a chance to win. Right now, 
you know, they're all, there's tons of great technologies. It's does the enterprise yet have the appetite to go, I want to be a software developer, right? Unlike a startup who that's their bread and butter, the enterprises are still figuring out. That's the real friction as to whether or not all these folks are going to make tons of money or whether it's going to be a slow drip to them, you know, making a little bit of money. So Docker Inc., which is powering the ecosystem, which is behind us, which is very yep. open source oriented, they're not really land grabbing, but they have some really good talent, a lot of XVMware, yep. obviously uh, Mariana uh, uh, at X XVM, Microsoft, XVMware. XVMware, XVMware yeah. Jerry Chen, we know, we, we know Jerry very well. Um, IT background, also very cloud oriented. Yes. Um, but yet you're starting to see Hewlett Packard Enterprise, big announcement uh, when we were at HP Discover in Vegas. IBM event <laughs> we're covering here on Wednesday. Right. They're gate crashing and bolting on an event um, on Wednesday. We'll be there covering it. These are big guys. Yeah. So partnership is really, really key. So how does that alliance uh, playbook look like? I mean, Microsoft really was good at that. Google's now learning. Right. IBM. Well, look, it's, it's classic stuff. You partner with somebody like HP, it, you know, that could be IBM, it could be Dell, it could be, you need a sales force. You need your technology embedded everywhere, make it easy as possible. It's exactly what made VMware get grow as fast as it did. I mean, you look at, you look at some of the pieces Docker has. They now have you know, a channel to help them get it out there in servers, well that's where they need to be. They have you know, this uh, registry and security technology. That's just like owning Active Directory in the Microsoft world, that's a crown jewel piece. Now they've got this uh, scheduling technology, very much like owning vCenter in the VMware space. They're starting to put together those really important control points, whether it's a distribution channel, security and authentication, you know, how the system clusters itself. Um, they're putting a lot of pieces in place. It's going to be really interesting to see if they can figure out how to monetize from that. Uh, but they've got a lot of the right pieces in place. So big news on the hashtag in, the, our, in our dashboard here it says Docker, Engine 1.12, yes. now available with built-in container orchestration. What the hell does that mean? Well, at the simplest level it says, if I have an application that needs a bunch of containers, so think about any multi-point, multi-process application, it has a database, has a front end, whatever. Um, containers for a while were really hard. How do I network them? How do I find other containers? How do I, you know, all that service discovery stuff that used to be built into those big clunky enterprise service buses that Oracle and SAP would charge you millions of dollars for. The container people are trying to make that super simple and Docker just said, you know what? I didn't, make it, I didn't make it simple enough in the past, I now have to make it even simpler, I'm going to embed it into my technology. And so if you're a Docker customer, you go, this just made my life simpler. If you're a Docker ecosystem person, you just went, hold on, the co-opetition between us maybe just got a little, more, a, little more, uh, a little more feisty. What are you hearing in the hallways and in customers around Docker? Obviously there's buzz there, HP yeah. is adopting it, and obviously that's a great move for HP. Right. But it gives their customers confidence that the containerization, whether, however that plays out, right. that they're going to have a hand in that. It seems like much more of a forward-looking deal, less specifics, we were trying to yeah. dig into it. But what are you hearing from people actually implementing this stuff? Right. Or are they implementing this stuff? What's, uh, what's the progress bar? Are they, are they implementing Docker in the IT, in the cloud enterprises, the ops guys? Yeah, I, that's, the big, that's the big thing. So there was a whole slew of studies and surveys that came out last week. I tell you what, if you read them all independently, you were super bullish about Docker. You know, you heard crazy things like 75 to 90% of people have it in production. And then you'd read another one from the Cloud Foundry Foundation. They said, well, I don't need, you know, containers aren't important enough. They're not powerful enough. A lot of it's going to depend on where you want to be in the market you're biased. The, the basic things I'm hearing, developers love Docker. It makes it really easy to do what I do on my laptop and make it the same in production. So that's a developer's dream. And it's super simple to package up an application. So a lot of those dependencies that are complicated, they love that. The operations people, I think, this stuff is so new to them. I mean, this stuff has come on the scene in the last year, 18, 24 months. You know, Docker beat the drum that they're the new VMware, and of course, operations people love VMware, so you know, what, what does this mean to my skills? That's the real divide. What do you Can, mean the new VMware? Explain. Well, you know, again, people wanted to make the argument, containers are going to replace VMs. And in some cases that makes sense, in other cases that's sort of not understanding the technology. But if you're an operations person, you have a VMware certification, you've been going to VMware for years, you, you know how to run it, you know what to do, and then somebody comes along and says, no, 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 scrap all that, learn Docker. Well, I got to learn Linux, I got to learn all these funky new words like Kubernetes or Swarm. I got to, I mean, it's, the learning curve is massive and when the developers are pounding on you and they're saying, get this stuff into production, you know, they're going, they're freaking out a little bit. Um, so operationalizing op sounds like an, a big issue. It's a big piece of it. That's, you know, that's why uh, you know, Docker made this announcement today. They said, you know what? 
embedding Swarm is an operational thing. It's got to be simpler. Got to make life simpler for the operations people. So that's where we're seeing a lot of effort on the Docker side because they realize if the operations people aren't on board, they're not going to put it in production. You know, their so ability. It's got to be simple. It's got to be, be the simple. TCO, total cost of ownership. And right. security is a big deal. Right, security is a big deal. Docker's done a great job around security. They've got a couple of people on the, that they hired over from, uh, I think they hired them from Square and from a couple of other companies that were really heavy in security. Um, because yeah, I mean, if, if you're letting your developers do anything they want, put anything they want in a container, wild, wild west, it could have malware in it. If you're an operations person, boy, you want to, you got to monitor it, you got to know if it's got, you know, is it secure, is it not secure? I got to have those tools built into my infrastructure, um, and that's what they're asking So Docker are we seeing a tsunami of containers coming on the market? If you bring that premise forward, and it's easy to use for developers, yeah. and Obviously, potentially well, the malware the tsunami comes if you're building new applications, because these are all built around new, well, actually, I, I take that back. Everybody here is now going, you know what? It works for any application, which of course is a land grab. You got to be able to yeah. get back into the legacy. Uh, but, but all the new stuff is going to be around new applications, and it becomes a matter of, is, am I building more mobile applications, more IoT applications? You know, application development still takes a while. It doesn't. Where does Cloud there. Foundry fit in all this? If someone is maybe scratching their head, saying, "Okay, I, I hear Blue Mix from IBM. Yep. Pivotal's got something out, of, out there. They're developing some new stuff. Um, Cloud Foundry's out. What is it? All, how does it all fit?" Yeah, the simplest way to think about it is, I mean, Docker began life as a PaaS. You know, they were a platform as a service company. Didn't necessarily pan out. They broke down the technology and said, "What can we do for developers?" Um, Cloud Foundry, what IBM Bluemix does, what Pivotal does, is really a, what I call a more structured platform, right? So it gives you everything. You just, you bring your, your code, it manages everything for you, it does monitoring, it does security, it does everything. Uh, Docker is a little more of what I call a composable platform. You know, developers bring what they like, but then, you know, operations has got some flexibility of what they want in there. So if you're the, if you're the Cloud Foundry camp, you're basically saying, hey, you know what? All these things that Docker's trying to do, we've been doing that for multiple years. We've been making it simpler for you. You know, don't buy into the hype. We've already got that for you. If you're in the Docker camp, you're going, those guys are way too rigid. You don't want to go down that path. We used to do that in the past. It didn't work for us. There's a lot of consternation between those two camps. So VMware, at last VMworld, Pat Gelsinger again, adopting the pro Docker rhetoric. Yeah, but he's, it's still, he, he, Pat wants to keep it on the down low as long as he can. You think so? Absolutely. Well, again, the press loves saying, Docker's the new VMware, Docker's the new VMware, and Pat's going, whoa, 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 hold on. You know, we're not dead yet. We're, we're still around. We're still vibrant. So, you know, it, he's sort of taking a wait and see approach. What They've about Microsoft to... Azure? Because we know Azure and VMware certainly competing. Yeah. Um, and Azure is doing well. Azure's uh, got a huge presence here. Azure has been, uh, you know, sort of the, I don't know, they, they've been the corner, they've been the, the, the banner uh, partner for Docker for the last year and a half. I mean, on the keynote stage, uh, there's a lot going on with them. They love, they love containers because yeah. it, it lets them say, hey, developers, doesn't matter if you're on Windows, doesn't matter if you're on Linux, we can run that for you. It's a great on entry point for Azure. Okay, so connect the, tea uh, the dots and read the tea leaves for your re latest research on cloud native. Yep. Assume that Docker's not going to sell to Microsoft or an IBM yeah. or yeah. somebody else. Um, where's the opportunity? Where do you see the market shifting? In the scenario of game changing, a complete blind spot that maybe people aren't seeing that yeah. it's going to explode the next uh, century of growth. Yeah, I, I mean, core tech, the, the, the container technology is going to be in this digital platform no matter what. It's, it's built to go fast, it's built to be easy for developers. All that's in there, regardless of what name you're going to buy it from. I think for Docker, uh, they're trying to make a complete play. I personally think they've got a huge, huge opportunity at the edge around identity, around security, around making developer tools simpler. Uh, you know, let anybody else run the middle, whether that's a cloud provider or whoever. Uh, but I think what we're going to see for companies, customers are looking for simplicity, so there's a big play for Docker there if they can simplify all this. They're looking for an on-prem plus a, a, a public cloud play so they can, you know, make mistakes and play with different things. You know, that's where Azure comes into play, that's where AWS comes into play, Docker's kind of tiptoeing around there. Uh, so it's, look, you know, we talk all the time, what inning are we in? We're still in like the first out of the first inning around who's going to win this thing. There's a lot of big bets being made, a lot of sort of strategic things on the map, but the revenue dollars aren't there yet to tell you who's winning. There's no and clear who's visibility on revenue. No. Very, very, very little visibility on revenue. You know, a little, a few little points, but not enough to make any big conclusions. I mean, the yet. worst thing Docker could do right now is put a stake in the ground and um, 
get out over their skis on trying to establish yeah, but a revenue I, I, model. You know, as, as an analyst, we would love for them to say, look, we're growing our revenue three times as fast, 10 times. You don't even have to give us a number, but give us a sense of what that looks like. We're not getting that from them. They're a private company, totally understand. But you know, we do get a sense of Cloud Foundry as a proxy from, from EMC and, and, and Pivotal, right? We, we understand yeah. that a little bit. We know what Amazon looks like. So we've got a couple of data points. We'd love to know what the container is. They got to figure out their revenue model, at least directionally get that right. Yep. I mean, Facebook didn't monetize advertising until they crossed right. their, the flywheel, and I was, I was pretty obvious. They have to figure out their version of the cloud revenue model. Absolutely, I, you know, I was thinking about this. You know, when you talk about billions of downloads, it's no different than saying, look, look how many Instagram users there were, or WhatsApp users. The difference is, there aren't going to be any ads that go with containers, right? Yeah. You got to figure out it's a different business model. transactional. Amazon has shown the way there, $10 billion. Yeah, we absolutely. We keep on called that early. Yep. And uh, we are here live on the ground, this is theCUBE at DockerCon in Seattle. I'm John Furrier, Brian Grace. So stay tuned for wall to wall, two days of coverage, siliconangle.tv. Keep, keep it here. Thanks for watching. We'll be right back.